Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Crossover. Starring Josh Johnson and Chris McGill. Featuring Christina Thorson. And of course, you, the Instagram live chat. Now, sit back and enjoy this week's edition of The Crossover. Powered by Card Ladder. What's up, man? I took a long nap today. I played some basketball today. But my session was co-opted by a guy just walking up on me and being like, hey, can I shoot with you? <clears throat> yeah, I guess. <laughs> Maybe he can rebound for you. <laughs> I just want to be left alone if I'm just shooting on a hoop, just, you know. Yeah. Unless you want to challenge me one on one and then we can play like a game or two. But he didn't do that. He just wanted to shoot with me. Is it like like one of those guys where as you're shooting, he's shooting and you have to like avoid it. You see their balls don't hit each other in the air and stuff? Wasn't even that. He want he came and co opted my ball. Oh, oh, even worse. So it's like a fit you have to like rebound your own shots from this guy? Yeah, and then like at one point he was like he's like, yo, like I'm gonna like I'm going to come running down the floor and, like, you pass me the ball. <laughs> I'm just like, all right. Oh, dude. my God. <laughs> and throw me an alley-oop and I'll just, like, lay it in. <laughs> hey, you're, you're talking about me like I'm going to go to the park. <laughs> <laughs> you never said he, did you? Was it, was it her? Was it Christina? No comments. <laughs> and then when I, as I was trying to leave, another guy comes up and he's like, hey, man, I have a question for you guys. And I was like, what's up? And he goes, do you believe it's possible that a group of people existed who never sinned? And I was like, uh, all right, guys, I have to go back to work. <laughs> You're like, I collect sports cards, so this is way too heavy for me. Like, I'm not here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I intentionally avoid questions like that, sir. Yeah, so I'm fresh off of a nice nap. I was outside today. Nice. It was a day. All right. Let's go here. <laughs> um, welcome to the crossover. Today is Friday, August 11th. Happy birthday, George. And do we have any mail days? Do you have any mail days? Yes. Do you? I have uh, a few that I need to, nothing, nothing huge, but a few, yeah. Uh, I'll go first today. Okay. All right. I'm really excited about this one. I showed it the other day already. I went live, but uh, 2007, another LeBron exquisite. Uh, 2007 exquisite emblems of endorsements. The reason I'm excited about this one is it's numbered to 10. Um, so the emblems of endorsements are usually the rarest. His rookie ones out of 15, second years out of 10, and then a few others are out of 15, 10, and 10. Um, so really excited about it. This is now my rarest LeBron. So I'm getting closer to you. No one-on-ones, but we're getting there. <laughs> That's amazing. Congrats. hyper focus on selling like the unnumbered stuff and the high serial numbers and buying, consolidating into lower serial numbers. Yep. That's the focus. Very nice. We have a question. We have so many collector questions that I think we'll probably touch on that. Cool. All right, let me uh, do my mail days quickly here. Um, the first one I have is uh, the 2019 Prism Gold Le'Veon Bell in the Jets Uni. Uh, this is actually a gift from a father and son collector duo that we met at the National. And I just nice. want to say thank you guys for this. I needed this one to complete the run. So that's awesome. Thank you. And then I have one other that uh, I could have touched on last week, but um, – I saved those these blessings for this. <laughs> so uh, this is from MK because I won a contest that he did mm. on Instagram. And so then he dropped these off with me at the National. A Le'Veon Bell Crusade rookie gold. A Christian McCaffrey rookies and stars crusade gold. <laughs> a Nikola Jokic Panini gold out of 10. And uh, he said he put the goat last. <laughs> well, he's a maverick, so he's thinking about you. He's definitely thinking about me. And this is a cool serial number because it's 135 of 135. Mm. So 
awesome. I guess that's the start to my Kyrie piece. Dude, any, any idiot can give an eBay gift card, but to actually find cards that you like is no small task. Indeed. Like, Indeed. you won the contest, and he spent the next three hours probably trying to find that stuff. Yep, no doubt. It was, uh, it was pretty awesome. Oh, and a Michael Jordan sticker as well. Mm. So, I've heard that guy's good. <laughs> he's not bad. All right. Um, MK was telling me that uh, one of the critiques of Jordan that's uh, floating around nowadays is that he's only regarded as a great basketball player because his shoes are popular. Uh, oh, what? So Who says that? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, but I think it's kind of clever, and I like it. So, I see – the ones I've been seeing recently, I get like these, uh, like, you know, you get like Facebook ads and stuff or Instagram ads. One of the ones I get is it's like some LeBron group or whatever that I'm not joined. And it's like number of games won without Pippin or something. It's like one of these like Pippin things. Yep. And it's like, oh my God, those are the worst ones. Come on. Pip, Pippin had like eight points in some of these games. So they posted that stuff. Uh, that, that's one of the main reasons why I hate Scottie Pippin. So well done. <laughs> Because of that, just because people use that stat. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's well, and also because Pippen has completely, you know, <laughs> tarnished the reputation of MJ after he, maybe de defensively so, after he didn't like how he came across in the last dance. Uh, well, that's what happens. Yeah. When you get to be the producer of the, of the show. You get to make it how you want. That's, so maybe if Scotty was better, he would have been the producer. Mm -hmm. Nice, I like that. MJ, and, uh, yeah, MJ paid for those the crew, right? That was MJ's crew. That was MJ's crew. I think that's right. I think that's yeah. right. I mean, yeah, let's go, Muhammad. F F Pippen is so overrated. Yeah, let's get that started. Let's I think go. it was like like uh, playoff wins with and without Pippen or something. I uh, I can't remember. It was some variation of that. I mean, Jordan is just a shoe merchant at the end of the day. <laughs> I think <laughs> the take that MK had was like the shoe. Shoes are probably what will keep him on top. Mm. It's just like a big separator. Like his, shoe, it's it's like impossible to overtake him on the shoe game. That, that yeah, that's probably true. Okay, all right, let's get to some questions. I have a, a ton. feature. I have a new th a thing. Of, of course, my bad. Let's go. Is this your first cross over, my guy? I, I know. I forgot how to do this. All right, it's quick though. So, uh, I've been working with the golden team and they launched a new card letter feature uh with my help but on the golden listings pages there's now a little button right here that says view sales history on card letter and it's going to be for this specific card so if you're looking at the mj red right here click on this button opens up a tab of card letter does a little searchy search for you and shows you comps for every jordan red and it's actually doing an image search, so it's trying to match up the image as best it can, as best it can. So you will get some parallels in there. So you might sneak a green in there. Um, nice. I like it better this way. I don't care to see what your thoughts. I know you've used it for a while, for a minute now. And uh, I personally like getting more data than less because I can kind of see like what the parallels sell for. I see what different grades are selling for because a lot of times if it's just if it's a perfect match of the grade, you know. Like a PSA 4, you basically get no data because the PSA 4 hasn't sold. But here you get all the BGS sales. You get the BGS 8, which is probably a decent comp for a PSA 4 on something like this. You get the green, so you can kind of see the multipliers, et cetera. So that's, that's what that is. And if you're an existing member, it will actually take you into your like app and sales history. If you're not a pet member, it will still work, and you'll get the top five sales. And then it'll, you know, attempt to... Uh, convert you to a pro member if you like it. So there you go. That's great. Yeah, I, I like that too. I like to cast a wider net because sometimes there's information out there that I want to know that I didn't know that I wanted to know. Right. And it can come up. A 504 person says, now you can fly on Ken's plane on season two Ooh. of his show. No. Oh, he wants me to sell cards to be on the show. No, thanks. Nice try. <laughs> that right. bait is not, not going to be taken. I buy cards, sir. Maybe we can get back to uh, one of those dinners, maybe, though. Oof, that's tough. I don't think that invite comes easily. <laughs> I don't think so, either. All right. Let's get to these questions now. Tons of questions. Strong okay. collector theme. Yeah, we don't have any 
we don't have any like big news or except the countersuit. We don't really have anything like that this week. So let's get to the collector. Yeah. Yeah. There are some topical hobby mm. things we're going to get to, but I always like to start us off with something light. So this comes from AP Cards 2030. Appreciate you, hobby barbarian. <laughs> oh, that's also a way to get bumped up to the front of the line. Uh, he says Justin Jefferson is setting a trail a trailblazing pace with the most receiving yards ever through his first four years in the NFL, 700 yards ahead of the next highest, which is Randy Moss. Has he already done enough to be seen as a future Hall of Famer so early in his career? And, and this is why I think you will be particularly interested in this question, Josh. Are you taking him at number one in fantasy? Or will you be going with C-Mac? So let's just talk a little fantasy. Let's talk a little Jettis. Let's get this. Let's uh, warm it up. I mean, I, if we do a, a handshake, I get Jettis, you get C-Mac. It's perfect. Deal, deal, deal. I'll, I'll take that deal. Because I, I obviously love Jettis. He's my favorite uh, NFL player currently, young player. Uh, drafted him last year really high. He turned out to be a good pick. He's had, he's had a great start. I mean, fantasy, man, like, it's so tough. You're basically, you know, you're just, like, hoping a guy blows up and ends up being the top overall guy. That's kind of how I treat the first and second round. Like, I'm just throwing darts at guys that I think could be number one overall. So, you know, C-Mac, Chase, uh, you know, Jefferson, Cup. There's a few guys that can do it. Eckler? Do you see Eckler, Eckler. as a first round pick? I'm Eckler. Actually, I know that people are going to take this the card route, but, like, I'm really, really high on Justin Herbert this year um, because last year he led the NFL in pass attempts. And I think he was, like, second in pass completions and second in yards, but he only had 25 touchdowns. And the offense was really more of, like, a dink and dunk offense, and now they've got a new offense coordinator. His ribs aren't broken anymore. He's added a, a top receiver in the first round to his already, like, stacked, you know, talent core. I think he's going to bump those 25 touchdowns up a decent amount. It was a lot of, like, bad luck, too, like, variance on the touchdowns. So, in fantasy, I'm pretty high on Herbert. Nice. Like it. Okay, that's that's a good fantasy pick. All right, I'm going to give one con to both Jefferson and McCaffrey. Uh, the, good luck. The con on McCaffrey. This is why everybody should stay away from McCaffrey. Not draft him. <laughs> especially if I'm in your league, just back off of them, <clears throat> is that there's an ever-present injury risk with him. He was healthy all last year, but the two seasons prior, he missed more than half the games. That's always a risk to, to think about with running backs, but especially McCaffrey. And then I'll add another risk, which is that there's so many weapons on that offense that yeah. he might not get a ton of touches either. Uh, you just you never really know. And then my con for Jefferson is that I was looking at fantasy pros yesterday. Yep, yep. And uh, doing a little research. And after, because me and uh, my brother were having a discussion about, you know, to what extent are wide receivers truly boom or bust? Mm -hmm. And I found a cool metric that they had that showed that last year Jefferson was a bust 19% of his games. Yep. So, and a bust means that he, I think, according to Fantasy Pros, a bust means that he scored less than the average wide receiver number 56 um, in, in at least 19% of his weeks. And, like, as Jose pointed out in the chat, some of those bust performances came at a bad time in the fantasy playoffs. So that's something to think about with him and wide receivers is that they can have huge weeks and then they can have, like, a four-point week. Yeah, that – dud against the Eagles early in the season where he had like two catches or something and the other con on him which is why I probably wouldn't take him first overall this year is that the Vikings like had the NFL record for like most close game victories ever so they were just like throwing the whole fourth quarter they had that overtime game against the Bills they're always throwing and playing catch up counter to the Eagles who like never threw in the fourth quarter and AJ Brown was still like I think the fourth ranked receiver so if you kind of like average those out aj brown is probably a similar player to jefferson in terms of fantasy so there's there's another tidbit for you all right there you go there you don't expect getting some fantasy with Dude, fantasy the fantasy football is, is my original love over cards so let's don't forget go. People. let's go that's so true all right leather helmet card says what are your thoughts on logan paul 
buying into the sports card world. And Josh, let me just tee that up for you. And then let me show, while you kind of ruminate on this, let me show what Shine had posted um, of him and Logan Paul. All right. So what, do you remember what two cards he picked up? Yeah, the MJ PSA 10 and the LeBron RPA. Exactly. So here's Shine giving those cards to Logan Paul. I don't have the noise on, but he kind of like makes a noise when he sees Le 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 LeBron. He goes like, ooh. Yeah. <laughs> and I know that noise. I've made that noise when I see a card that I like as well. I know a lot of people are going to criticize this, but I, and Logan Paul has this history of like NFT scams. And like, I know he's got a interesting past and he's not like the best person, but he does seem to actually be pretty interested in cards in general. He does seem to be genuinely interested in, the, in collecting. He doesn't obviously know much about sports cards. I think he comes, he's mostly Pokemon. So that might be interesting. I, I personally like don't, you know, pay much attention to this kind of stuff. I, I just don't see how like one celebrity can affect the market that much. I know, I know people have told me like he came into Pokemon, it like shot up in value and then kind of came right back down. So it was kind of a, you know, boom bust thing. And it was like really correlated to him. So I don't know. Yeah. I, you know, the first thing I felt also want to send a shout out to Tyler sports guy who came in to drop some blessings on us. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I just want to say that the first thing I felt was a little, was, I, I felt like this mix of sympathy and fear <laughs> for Logan Paul, because we've seen this before where like, uh, like, like Timbaland, when Timbaland came in and then I just feel terrible that he's gotten crushed on the PSA 10 Fleer Jordan, you know, like it's, that's what I just feel. I feel concern and worry. Um, but you know, I, I also heard like, this is such a stupid analysis that I'm going to offer, but I heard that little squeak he made when he saw the card. And I know what that squeak means. That squeak is the squeak of excitement at looking at a beautiful sports card. And if he can produce that squeak, there's something in his heart that is truly fond of yeah. sports cards. Well, I collected Pokemon cards before sports cards. And I, it wasn't for long because I just got really bored with like how easy it was to acquire Pokemon cards. It was just like, there's just like not enough rarity for me. The scarcity is, is not there. There's no serial numbering. Like I just got bored so quick. So he'll probably be excited about that, that shift. Pretty, you know, he'll, he'll, uh, I mean, the FLIR isn't numbered, but the RPA at a 99 and the PSA 10 is still semi-rare. Yep, definitely. Not a bad two sports cards to start out with. You didn't buy a rock, rock card, you know, like a silly, like, cutout rock card or whatever that thing is. Yes. All right, here is a pretty dicey topic, I think. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I know that you and me are going to come at it from a similar point of view. And uh, I've, I've had some discussions with some people about this topic um, earlier this week. So, like, I learned a little bit more than I previously knew. Anyway, let me just get to the questions. All right. There's three questions. Or there's – well, let's just take these one by one. Drake's PC says, after market autographs, especially mm -hmm. on vintage cards, seem to be gaining popularity by the week. Is this an evolving collector space in the hobby or – is it the next big pump and dump? So are, do you want me to come at this from like a personal opinion on, on, on these types of cards, the pump and dump part of it, or like how I think it fits into the overall structure of cards? <clears throat> I, I need to hear all three, yeah. probably in that order. I think I want to start with the overall structure of cards. Gotcha. And you always use this, this example, and I'll, I'll start with it and steal it. Uh, it's a similar like memorabilia in sports cards if people wanted to buy memorabilia you know they would just buy the jersey it would be cheaper to just buy the whole fucking jersey than it is to get the patch inside a specific card it would be cheaper to buy a cut autograph you know separate from the card what makes the value the bit you know the foundation of the value is always the card um you know you know you're talking about like rpas they've got the jerseys and the autos it's it, the whole card kind of together having all these different 
aspects of it is what makes it valuable. And the autograph and the memorabilia kind of like tack on to the value. Um, but the difference though with the this thing is that it's like the card wasn't designed to be autographed in these cases. We're talking about like, are we talking about like you bring the card to the athlete, have it signed and then grade it after? Yes. Yeah, so the card wasn't like actually designed for that. So it's it's a little bit of its own category, right? It's not like a it's not a traditional it doesn't fall under the traditional landscape of cards. So it's not as valuable as like an exquisite or like a, a card that was meant to be signed, in my opinion. And it shouldn't be. Because otherwise, if you're going to come at it from this, you might as well just buy the autograph on a poster and then buy the card and the rookie. Um all that said, you know, it is a cool niche. I I think it's neat. If people want to collect it you know, go for it. But keep in mind that it's not a part of like the traditional licensed faction of the hobby, which is, which is always the most important to me. Yeah. I think that's a really balanced approach to it. <clears throat> I think it's right. And like, there's no denying that uh, there's a level of excitement for these cards. That's authentic. And um, there's a, there's a real movement for them. And like, I've looked at some of the pages of people on Instagram who have a bunch of these, a bunch of these vintage rookie cards of players who don't have any autograph cards from our playing years. And just like, I, the page looks cool. You know, it's like all these like nice vibrant colors from vintage cards and then these cool autographs on them. It looks good. I like, I get the aesthetic appeal. I get the appeal of it. Um, some of the things that I struggle with though are that I would be more comfortable with this category to your point if it was regarded as a memorabilia category. Mm. If we described and thought of these items as memorabilia, no different than getting a football signed or a jersey signed or a piece of paper signed or a poster signed, then I would be 100% comfortable with it. But the shoehorning in of this category under the umbrella of sports cards is where I start to get uncomfortable with it. Uh, and... That's because, to me, a sports card is, is in its true state is something that's licensed by the league, licensed by the player, is manufactured by the person who is licensed to manufacture it. It's put, in, it's put into a pack and distributed in that format. And that's my concept of a card, of a true sports card. And then as we sort of take away different elements of that, you know, we start moving a little bit further away from my concept of a sports card. So with the, uh, with the in-person autograph cards, it just makes me a little uncomfortable because it feels like, it feels like, a it feels like people are going and getting these autographs and they're manufacturing their own sports card right. by putting the autograph on it. And they're doing it in some instances to, to increase the value of the card. Right. That, that's why it's being done, to increase the resale value of the card. So I'm like, okay, I get it. And that's cool. That's part of the, that's part of the hobby. That's part of the spirit of the hobby, dealing, flipping. I get it. Um, but the counterpoint to that is that the thing that seemingly should be giving an item like this value is that it's the personal experience of obtaining that autograph yourself. Um, that's what the autograph, the in-person autograph symbolizes to me. That's what makes it the coolest thing is the, in, like, like we own, Christina and I have retained a ticket stub. We don't collect ticket stubs. We don't grade ticket stubs, but we kept the ticket stub of the first ever Luka Doncic game that we went to it, at Staples center in LA back in 2019 and we also got an in-person autograph of Luca on his prism rookie base card but those cards are cool to me and to us because of the experience of getting them right, right. that's where the value is derived from so I just I get a little concerned that like because if we if, if we as collectors can like manufacture our, our own cards, if we can go out and put autographs on cards, increase the value, sort of create this new category of in-person autographs, you know, where's the checklist for it? Like what checklist do these cards exist on? Um, where, how, do, how do I know how many are out there? How, how do I know how many are being manufactured? 
you know, these, those are the, some of the things that start to worry me as a collector. So. Yeah. Um, I want to give a shout out to Sasha P cards. He's been, he's been collecting this stuff and collecting it for real. I think genuinely for a long time. So I kind of wanted to separate him from what I'm going to say next, because, you know, I think guys like that, who I think he's collecting, he's trying to get a, a rookie card card autographed by every hall of famer. Right. So he's actually like collecting it and he's putting it together. I think most of them are PSA graded, et cetera. The issue with the pump and dump part of this is that to your point, like it's being used, like cards are being used as a tool to generate revenue for yourself, to generate money, the flip, the pump and dump. And then we've seen a lot of this over the last few years where cards are being used to generate interest in some other category. Like we're the, we're the ones being used in this scenario of like, I know people really like cards. I don't exactly know why, because I, you know, I'm not a collector, but I, you know, I just need to capitalize on this somehow. And I need to find my own way to make money off of this without, because I don't have any, I don't have the means to like create my own cards and just sort of like force my way into this. So let me just find a new way. Let me make NFTs, or let me make fractional cards, or let me make, uh, you know, unlicensed cards. Like, and this kind of feels like that category of just like another way to generate your own sort of market within the space or let me you know let me make ticket stubs off of this and let me just try to get your attention on something else that i can control right yeah that's a great way to sum up where i start feeling uneasy about it as well yeah. is that like is this a is this a business that's being hatched that's a marketing strategy or you know is it a collectible and i just get a little bit <clears throat> i get i'm on the fence a little bit about it but I also don't collect them, you know, so like I'm, I sort of have a bias of protectionism towards the stuff that I like and the stuff that I collect. And I will give it this credit um, on the continuum of like sports card versus like totally invented category for a short term, you know, prop profit situation like Top Shot or something like that. I think that um, there's a rich history of people using sports cards and other items and pictures, etc., and having athletes sign them. And in fact, it was the manufacturers who sort of co-opted mm-hmm. this grassroots behavior of getting in-person autographs. They, they co-opted it and turned it into uh, something that they could put into packs and they, they formalized it and they corporatized it a bit. Yeah. And so, you know, I want to acknowledge that and say that this started from a, a natural place um, and then, you know, it became crystallized as a part of sports card checklists and so on and so forth. And then it became a huge aspect of cards, just autograph cards and memorabilia cards. So I want to give it that respect. It's basically what I'm getting at here. You got their, their cards in the chat, he says. Once you, see, uh, once you see certain people buying this stuff, that's usually your – your hint that it's uh it's a pump and dump it's time to get out right <laughs> i wasn't aware of that i was not aware i haven't heard much about this i, I saw all the questions yeah but i, I haven't seen any of that stuff yeah no it, there's a, there's it's a topic right so we had another question about it from junk wax packs who says uh signed vintage is the new wave is there concern with fake autographs whether graded or raw in this category of course this is there's like documentaries about this with people scamming other people with fake signatures on memorabilia, of, you know, basketballs and jerseys and cards. This is always going to be a concern. Uh, Cause like with something like this, you know, like it literally says in the back of the card, LeBron signed this. Th- this is what you're talking about. The corporatization. Yes. Uh, I wish you wouldn't use that word. Cause I like autograph cards, but it's oh, like, I know. I know. I, it's I, the I, I do too. license. It's the licensing of it. That makes it important where it's like yes. a representative you know, sent this to LeBron or was with LeBron. That's what made cards and memorabilia more attractive to people because it's like more official and licensed. Whereas the, you know, the, uh, the stuff, the stuff we're talking about now, there's, I mean, you can get it graded and PSA can look at it, but you're never really like a hundred percent sure, you know, it's a little bit risky. Yeah. And the other nice part about it being licensed is that it's in, in, and applying the, the rules of, of uh of of collecting and of and the the philosophies of collecting i should say is that 
we as collectors can put up a resistance to the manufacturer to say, look, you know, you, you better put as many as you can in the player's rookie year, for example, or you better squeeze as many as you can into their playing years, because that's all that we're going to collect. We're going to, yeah. we're going to limit the scope of what we collect. And then when we limit the scope of what we collect, it allows us to define in a finite fashion, the amount of items that are available. And that's so important to collecting because think about it. Wouldn't the manufacturer side and the business side of this industry, wouldn't they love to be able to just make a million more of the best cards and put them up for sale directly and sell them to us? But you know what? What that ultimately does is it devalues the cards that we cherish and that we've collected. So th there's always this push and pull of like, hey, is upper, you know, back in, back in the 90s, is, is that upper deck Griffey going to get run off the presses a million more times and done quietly so nobody knows at the time how many are actually being made, you know, that's the worst case scenario. So that's why I like pushing back and saying, I like the licensed product. I like knowing as much as we possibly can about how much of that product was made and that the product stopped being made. Whereas with aftermarket autographs, that's a product that can keep getting made yeah. uh, until the signer perishes. Um, so, it's just things I think. Uh, I kind of want to end this discussion with, you know, if you like the in-person autographs, you like this category, it's fun for you, you collect it, like, by all means, I think the point of what we're trying to get at is, like, and what we've always done in the show is, you know, we've got healthy, uh, you know, optimism for the future of the hobby, but we're also, like, skeptical of something when we feel like it's not quite in line with, uh, you know, the up and up of the hobby. And we're here to kind of call it out, help people. So if you're coming, if you're new to the space, like just be careful with this, with this topic and like, make sure you do the research. If you're buying licensed autographs of, you know, th things like exquisite, then you're and and Panini cards and that, you know, RPAs and stuff, you're much, much safer. It's got a long history of people collecting that stuff. You're always, you know, the serial numbering, you've got the, you know, the guarantee on the back by Panini, et cetera. So just that stuff is always going to be much safer. And if you're going to do the in-person autographs, just know that it's, it's currently going through a little bit of a pump and dump and also it's risky. Yes. Yeah, that's totally well said. <clears throat> um, okay. What, there was one more from Vinny. He said, Vinny Slyberino says, always enjoy the show. Always enjoy your questions, Vinny. Nice. After, after market autographs on cards seem to be popular of late. What if all those extra sticker autograph companies were sitting on? So all those extra sticker autographs that we know that Panini has and stuff. What if they were used on non-autograph cards? What do you think the price bump would be? Might that be a way to add at least some value to otherwise valueless base cards? Thanks, Vin. Like a like a buyback kind of thing where you're like sticking these stickers on post pack opening. I think so. Yeah, I think he's envisioning like uh, maybe, you know, like let's say Panini has 100 Jason Tatum sticker autographs and then they go on to the market and buy 100 of his Don Russ base cards and then put the sticker, sticker autographs on those Don Russ base cards and then maybe sell them on their website or something. This doesn't feel like a good idea and I feel like there's some legal issues to this of like, you know, not having J Jason Tatum's permission or something to like put these autographs on things that weren't supposed to be. I don't know, but this feels weird. Yep. I think that's fair. It's a creative idea though, Vinny. I, I do like the creativity. It is. Behind I, I haven't heard that. I haven't heard that one before. Yeah. Okay. Uh, G2, like there's a couple questions in this tone this week. Ooh, which I, I like tone. Which I found amusing. Okay. I really like, this is, I was amused by this. Uh, G2 Cards <laughs> says, what is the worst tangible investment and why is it sports cards? <laughs> Can you explain this to me more? Am I missing I, something? I, I, um, I think that there's always some, there's, there's always going to be this sentiment, but I think this sentiment like emerges more like this, the desire to just kind of like be like, let's chill with the investment mm. overdose. 
-hmm. you know, like, let's just knock it down a peg. I think that's the heart of this here, you know, and it's, <laughs> and, and like, uh, like, we haven't had this uh, sentiment in months. Yep. So, like, it tells me that like, okay, well, there, there's like the investment stuff is heating up again. Yeah, I, I was thinking exactly what you were just saying, which is like, I texted you this the other day which was like it, we can't win either the market's going down and everyone is like shitting on it with like graphs of showing the top of the thing and showing where it is now and how everyone's stupid and collecting is dumb but now we're gonna have the reverse where everyone's like bragging about all their gains and showing like their same card 50 times over trying to pump the market like either when you're going up and up in the market or down it kind of seems like uh you know people come out of the woodwork to annoy us so It'll, it'll always be like that. They do. So like I started thinking just now, what are some other tangible assets? <laughs> I don't even know like exactly what that means. I'm not sure either, right? Okay, so. Like physical items? Well, like, okay, so like, here we go. Sta this is from Investopedia, which is just one of the first links I got when I just Googled this. It sounds official. Yeah. Uh, standard <laughs> types of tangible investments include real estate, gold, bull, a, a, aka uh, four walls and a tube that takes your shit from your toilet to a septic tank. <laughs> I didn't think you were ready to use that on the crossover, but here ready, we go. I am ready to use it. You've um, been brewing on that pig for a while. <laughs> Just like the tubes have been brewing the shit around the house. Uh, gold bullion is another tangible asset. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's been some bullion investment coming up on some of my hobby accounts. Uh, art? Cars. Super cars. Cars? Um, antiques? Uh, there, that's, that's the extent of the list that they give here. So, uh, uh, people have, have people asked you in real life, you know, like, how come you invest in those? Why don't you buy cars or why don't you buy real estate? Why don't you do real estate rental properties or why, why are you doing cards? Have people asked you that? No, no. I think people look at me and they're like, this guy doesn't know what he's doing anyway. <laughs> I think, yeah, it's some, something along that, that tone of like, are you stupid? Like <laughs> sports cards. And I kind of just, you know, shrug it off and laugh like, yeah, I'm an idiot, you know, right. but really it's just like, we just know this space so well that like, I would probably get annihilated in any of those other ones. Right. And I'm sure there's people that are in those spaces that do great in those that make fun of mine, you know, but it's really just a matter of like, we have experience in this space, you know? 100%. So look, G2 cards, I'm going to push back. I'm going to say that all tangible investments are equally bad. We you need a, that. you need a way to break down your take on the tubes in a box box delivering shit to like a, a really like bite-sized thing yeah no, no i know i know I, I feel like it'll we'll get there like this was sort of like a, a natural way to just introduce it to the audience uh, i don't know if shit box is the right one like i feel like it's got to be like shit tube delivery system or something like you know yeah, I, yes. people are definitely in the in the in the audience right now like what's happening what are they talking about <laughs> shit beast is that were you back on nfts all right. We're always on that team. We never leave them. No, we don't. All right. Uh, Carlson Cards says, do you think we will see more collector showcases over time? There was a Randy Moss one last night, and it was awesome. I'm curious as to why you two think we don't see more of this type of content, pulling in longtime collectors and deep diving a specific player and sharing their cards, and it usually seems to be in a top 10 format. I want to rope in the question that Alex asked, which is like, is there a difference between influencers and content creators? Nice. And this question answers that for me nicely. Yes, you can create content that is not influential. Well, I mean, you know, whatever, God, someone's gonna be like, that does influence you to buy. Um, but the focus is more around like the curation and showcasing of cards themselves. And that's the content that we desperately need more of. And, and I feel like it, there's a spotlight on that right now. People are noticing that and there's discussion around it, I feel like more of that content will start to bleed out. And I think Austin's done a good job of pointing it out and also doing a lot of it himself. So yeah, we definitely need more of it. Yeah, 
Well, and, and, you know, the thing is, like, I was thinking about this from, like, the Michael Jordan collector perspective or, or like, like the Luca collector perspective or something. And just being like, you know, who's going to fire it up? Who's going to be the one to be like, yeah, let's, you know, let, let me bring on some of these other collectors. They probably have better cards than me. And let's just all gawk at them. I, I think that's a little bit of the hold up here is that mm. we're competitive against each other. If we're all collecting Michael Jordan cards, you know, we're all competitive. We all like our collection a lot. And, you know, it's, do we want to sit there and in awe at nine other Michael Jordan collections that we get to go and show ours, you know? Like, yeah, I do. I do want to, I do want to do that. I do. But I understand why people don't necessarily jump up and just do it. Yeah. You know, it really takes like a selfless person to orchestrate it and to put it on and to like let people get their shine and show off their cards. And you know, that's what it takes. Um, and, and I think it's great. I think it's great when people do this. I think that this, this, category of content has a lot of room to evolve and to you know get more and more efficient um and, and refined but yeah I, I i'd love to see more of it the biggest issue i had with cardboard chronicles back in the day was like getting some of like the quieter private people to like come on camera and show their cards it was just like a struggle a lot of times and what you said made me think of that. So there's a, there is that kind of barrier where like some of my favorite collectors and <clears throat> collections out there. I mean, just look at the Bob M track. I had I only got him on the show because he I agreed to not show his face and like you know I get it. Some of these guys, uh, especially knowing that like this hobby itself is really like at its core meant to be like an individual private kind of thing, and so like like it was never really designed to be. You know, like, hey, let me just like show all this stuff off to everybody in the world kind of thing. And it's it's morphed into that with social media and stuff, but uh there is that side of it. Yeah. <clears throat> I agree with that too. There there is the private nature and the introverted nature of a lot of collectors that's gonna it's uncomfortable, you know, and putting yourself out there on Instagram live. I mean, we've been doing ours for three and a half years. So yeah. like a little easier for us to just get on here and say things and not be nervous or feel weird. Yeah, but it's it's very awkward. <laughs> Can you go straight at Alex's question and just like give me your because we talk about influencers a lot on the show and I want to hear like your yeah um, organized sort of take on like what is an influencer to you and why do you not like it? <laughs> oh well, God, we only have an hour and a half. I know, I know. I'll keep it short if you can. <laughs> that's the, that's the biggest challenge I've ever received. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I like the challenge too. Daily. Sports card stallions question is influencers and content creators, is there a difference? Um, there is. I think that all influencers are content creators, but not all content creators are influencers. So you have the broader category of content creator and then influencer exists inside of it. And, uh, yeah, let me write that down, Steph. Um, okay. So with that said, um, what is the definition of an influencer and the more technical definition of an influencer, not just restricted to sports cards, but just in general is that an influencer is somebody who uses their credibility and their reputation and their popularity to sell a product to their audience. That's what an influencer is on the technical definition. And you can quickly imagine lots of content creators who aren't doing that. Okay. So that's how you can be an influencer and a content creator, but you could also be a content creator who isn't positioning their credibility for the end purpose of selling a product. Um, now, so, so that, that's sort of, that's the difference. And I guess where the topic goes from there is in the hobby in particular, more so than any other category of content I've ever seen, there is a <laughs> built in skepticism, defense mechanism against people who are saying things for their own self-interest. It, it exists, it is strong. 
in this hobby. It's it's one of the uh, it's one of the best parts of this hobby is that every like every audience member or a lot of audience members start from the position of what type of bullshit is this guy trying to sell me? <laughs> and then work their way back <laughs> and, then, yeah, and see if we can sort of get to a level of trust eventually. And that's, right. that, and, and it's not that way by mistake. It, it, a, it's a function of the personalities of the people in the hobby who I think just sort of are naturally predisposed to be skeptical, mm -hmm. but it's all, or, or a little curmudgeonly, but then B it's also a byproduct of the way that a collectibles market works is that they're all the, like to use myself as an example and to poke fun of myself here. When I post a card of my own, you know, I'm calling attention to it. I'm saying, look how cool this is, you know, come like this and tell me it's great and <laughs> read my story about how much it means to me. And like, if that story resonates or if people really like it or it, or it connects to them or it makes them think about something a little bit differently, there's a world where that increases the appeal of the card or, you know, or something, or, it, or it's, you know, it's enhanced, it's serving my, serving me in some way. And it's true. Um, and we all sort of get that intuitive, intuitively. So, you know, we're, all, we're skeptical right off the bat, like when we're showing things off, we're flexing our cars, we're talking about our opinions. And so like the, the number one way I think to address that in a straightforward fashion as a content creator is to just say right up front and as often as you can without being awkward, here's what I collect, here's my interest, here's what I'm saying could benefit me, and you should know that as an audience member. I'm not gonna stop talking about it, and I'm going to be happy about it, I'm gonna share my joy with it, but understand that it creates biases, and it creates an environment that could be self-serving for me. So understand that. And then when I say things, like when I'm talking about in-person autographs or talking about a player that I like or anything, understand that it's coming from a place of bias uh, based on years of collecting and decisions that have been made and so on and so forth. And, and, and that's like the safeguard, I think, that a content, the best safeguard a content creator can come up with is just saying what your biases are and then being very receptive to criticism. If somebody you know, is upset or doesn't like something like, hear them out um, because they, they might be coming at you aggressively or on maybe even unfairly, but there's a, there's a kernel of truth in it almost always. And I think the influencers get into a position where they aren't thinking about any of that. They're thinking about how do I capture an audience by convincing them that I'm an expert and then funnel them into buying something that creates money for me. And the less that they're aware that I'm doing it, the better. That seems to be sort of the influencer's mantra. And I think that's one of the main reasons why there's an instinctual, visceral dislike for influencers in the hobby. The other, um, that's, that's good. It wasn't short, but I, I didn't expect it to be short. And I'm glad it wasn't. I think you did a nice job uh, summarizing it. Uh, the other thing I wanted to add, and then I'll stop, is that a lot of us can pinpoint pretty quickly if the basis of, of what you're doing as a content creator is to uh, focus on your collection, your cards, or it's going to be on yourself and money. It's usually one of those two categories, and we're this space is really skeptical when we figure out that it's about you and the money. And we start to get judgmental. We start to figure out, you know, you're just sort of like manipulating me, pretending you like a certain card so that you can eventually dump it on someone else and then make money for yourself. And then the, the basis of your content is really just around you being famous and you like bringing attention to yourself. Those are like the, the biggest indicators usually of what we're talking about. So if you're looking at an IG page and it's just like a flood of pictures of themselves doing whatever various activities, money on the table, et cetera, or it's like a bunch of their cards and you know what they collect. That's usually like the easiest way to tell. And that's where our sort of radars and like, you know, alarm bells start going off because we've seen it so many times. And uh, like we're in this space because of cards, not, you know, influencers. If I wanted to, if I wanted to follow influencers, influencers I would just go watch the Kardashians you know like there's other places where I can get influencers I'm here for sports cards so that's that's my last 
tidbit there. Love it, yeah. And Erica says most don't have a collection, and that is like one of the red flags yeah. for right. sure. And like, I think like that makes me think about how um, a really a much simpler way, a way I could have kept my part much shorter is just by saying, is the authenticity there yeah. or not? Genuine, yeah. Is there an authentic passion for this space and for the cards, or you know, is this uh, is this about something else? You know, well, <laughs> the reason you can add to this, but the reason we get so fired up is like that doesn't help sports cards move forward and grow. If the you know if there's not like a genuine interest in it, and you're just sort of like moving through it in order to generate profit for yourself and just sort of like move past it and not really. You're just sort of using the hobby for your own personal gain. It doesn't actually move the hobby forward. It moves you forward. So, like, we're trying to bring a spotlight to individuals who, you know, help the greater good of the hobby itself, you know? Yeah, and that's a whole other can of worms that we could tackle, I think. <laughs> like, I just want to leave it there. I think you said it really well. Well, we, like, dan we dance around this topic a lot, and I, I thought it would be good to, like, just jump and be head on with it. Yeah, I know. I love Love it. I, we we can uh, we could do five crossovers about that. This is a bit like every every time we hang out in person. This is usually what we talk about. So this is a good crossover. True, topic. true, true, true. Okay, uh, let me get to Ben Cross Country Runner One, who uh, says I think most collectors would agree. We have seen more rare and supposedly scarce stuff come to the market in the last two to three years than any other two to three years stretch in the past. So. If we assume that that's true, what do you think it says about our hobby, which is scare quote collecting cards? Hmm. I mean, to be fair though, like when some of that stuff 10x, people like never intended for that to happen, and so like that's why you saw when something 10x is, you're just going to see an increase in that cards coming out for sale, and there's a lot of that. So I kind of want to give a pass to some of those people, or it's like, you know, I've been. I never expected this card to be worth, you know, amount of money that could change my life or where I could, you know, sell this thing and, and like build out a whole nother collection a few years from now, you know, so there is some of that going on, but it is a lot, a lot of like what we talked about in the last topic where there was a lot of like uh, non-genuine push up of the market and like cards sort of like the same three copies coming up for sale over and over between people that never actually wanted to own the card. So there's, it's mostly that, you know, like I would say it's a good bit of like, you know what I'm talking about? Like we just kept seeing like the, we're like, Oh, the PMG reds, you know, sold so many times or whatever, but like it was the same five copies right. in the same, like RPA LeBron would sell over and over this, like sell for a million. It would be relisted because the debt collecting was coming up and now it sells for 300 or whatever. And it's just like, we kept, we, there was a lot of that. So that, that to me felt like the main culprit. Yeah. I believe there was a PMG red that was purchased at the very peak of the market by a fractional company. So like that's the first transaction, the first sale of it. Then it was offered on the fractional platform and then people, People bought shares in the IPO, and then they're trading the shares. So that's like the second transaction. And then the card was taken off of the fractional platform and sent back to auction again. And then there's your third transaction of the same card in like an 18-month period. So. <laughs> what, do you th what do you think about um, – I've been thinking about this topic because I sold some cards last week, and I was thinking about this. It's like, do you think we sort of have – a, a responsibility as collectors to, to try to keep the supply low by keeping it away from public auctions and trying to like sell more cards privately. What do you think? What do you think about that? Just like as a general toss up topic. And Well, I guess like a related topic or a related way of looking at it is should we be, should we pick and choose who we sell stuff? To? Yes, exactly. Same, same, same idea. Yeah. Yeah. And like, there is definitely an undercurrent of that because like sellers will take pride or collectors who are parting ways with the card and doing so sort of in a bittersweet way, like they have to take the opportunity or they have another card they want to upgrade to or whatever, but they're looking at it and it's bittersweet. They don't want to sell it, but they understand that it's the right move to make for them at that time. 
But if they sell it to somebody that they know is going to keep it and cherish it, they point that out. You know, they say like, hey, this card's going to a good home. Right. You know, like, and, they, they, and so like, I see this. There's definitely an undercurrent of that, that people take pride in placing a card from their collection into another collection that they respect. I think that's absolutely a factor. But also, I'll be more specific. Um, like, as a way to increase the health of the hobby and the market by not introducing more supply, if you're keeping it more private, does that actually like help the value long term more? Maybe. You know, the other thing to be said though is that it's always like you and I were talking about this this week. Like, we both sold a few cards from our collections in the recent past. And then we've also been picking up new cards too. And we like, my point of view on this is that selling a card, especially when you've been like in a drought, a lays induced or drought like myself, selling a card feels great. Yeah. Selling a card gives me more confidence in the collectibles markets. It connects me to other people who are collecting cards as well. You know, like it's just, it, it just feels, there's a vote of confidence that comes from selling a card that just feels nice. And it is different, a different vote of confidence than buying a card. <clears throat> so, you know, I just think about that and I say, but the flip side of it is that if everything's done in the private, you know, it's harder for other people to share in that vote of confidence. You know, mm -hmm. like when we do see stuff sell at auction, you know, it's cool, man. It's, it's cool. We love watching the, the auctions end and seeing where their stuff goes and uh and what cool cards come up like but it, as much as it like pained us to see like flooded premiere and elite auctions it also pains us to see them now in their sparse state as well yeah that's, that's the answer i was thinking too is just like it's a balance you know like it's it's kind of a it's a fun hobby experience like i got so much happiness and joy buying this from justin you know like getting it from him him overnight versus waiting for a vault and like you know knowing him and i didn't really go back and forth on price too much because we're friends and stuff like it does for make for fun stories that card hasn't sold publicly at auction in like 10 years and i like that part of it so knowing that i was able to keep it off public auction by buying it private but to your point like card ladder wouldn't be very very good if there was no public sales and i remember when you first started doing um house of jordan's you obviously got your content from public auctions, right? So it kind of like, it enabled you to like analyze the market. Otherwise with privates, you, your private sales only, you wouldn't have been able to do that. So it's a, it's a, uh, it's a balance yeah. there. Definitely a balance. All right. Um, Mad City Collector says, baseball is clearly the longest tenured, most mature segment of the hobby. What, if anything, do you extrapolate from the baseball segment of the hobby that you use to inform your basketball collecting? And then Hauser 1921 collection put a comment on this. He said, or she said, uh, information provided would suggest not purchasing anything other than a long career affiliate player or sport. So, so I, I guess that sort of says like by the best, I don't want to reduce it to that because if he wanted to say that, he would have just said that. But yeah, okay. what, do you, what do you think about this topic? Yeah, that was kind of going to be my answer was like what I've learned from baseball is like, you know, sort of like I, I wouldn't say the longevity or like the duration of time for the player. I would say like the history of the, the hobby, like learning that specific sets and parallels and like the lineage of the cards themselves are a huge factor in what drives value and popularity of a card. That's what I think I've learned from baseball is like, you know, why, why do we put so much emphasis on 52 tops baseball? Um, you know, it's easy to say as a basketball collector, Oh, just cause it's old and like all these, you know, old vintage guys love it, whatever. But yeah, if you understand the reason as a basketball, collector you can kind of learn from it and apply that to basketball like why is 2003 exquisite so popular why is 86 player so popular like it's a similar reason to 52 tops you know which is around like 
the actual manufacturing of the cards, the licensing of the cards are, is very important. And the rarity and like, you know, the thought that went into it when it was created at the time, there's a, you know, there's like a lineage and a history to cards that I think is important. And that's why that IP discussion is so important and the unlicensed and stuff, because I, you know, I, I know you, uh, you know, I talk about this a lot, but like the foundation of the cards themselves and like the reasoning behind why this card is more important than that card. There's a, there's a lot of reasons to it and that's important to this, to this space. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> that's really good. Uh, the only, some of that I think about, especially with Hauser 1921 collections comment is like, I actually think that there's something super applicable about this to football right now, which is something so important in the history of football happened in February of this year, which is Patrick Mahomes completed the MVP Super Bowl champion Super Bowl MVP sweep and now has two Super Bowls, two Super Bowl MVPs, and two MVPs, and amazing statistical production, led the league in QBR. There's like this sense sort of among mainstream commenters, among the hobby prices, among hobby people that like Josh Allen and Herbert and Burrow and Lamar and Hertz and, you know, the, these guys are like in the same tier or close to Mahomes. And you know what? They are not. I would have entertained that last year. And I would have entertained it if Mahomes lost the Super Bowl this year. Even if he would have had two MVPs, but just one Super Bowl and one Super Bowl MVP, I would have been more amenable to that. But now, this is so clearly Patrick Mahomes' era to me. So clearly his era. From, from when he took over as starter in 2018 to today. Like, he's already got half a decade of dominance. And I don't foresee it ending um, without something extraordinary happening. That, that, like, when we think about eras of sports cards and we think about what what defines them in the long run and how many times I've like sort of heard somebody say like, man, why was I collecting Keith Van Horn in the nineties? <laughs> I could have been picking up Michael Jordan cards, you know, and like instead you know, like, you're like looking at Beckett price guide values and seeing that the Chris Weber finest refractor was worth more than the Michael Jordan finest refractor from 93. And yeah. like, I'm not saying Mahomes is Jordan because he's got a long way to go before he's that. But what I am saying is that he is in a different category from a legacy hobby point of view right now. I, I Where he's like, his prices are like 100%, and then Allen and Burrow and Herbert are like 80%. You're saying they should be like 30 Yeah. 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 Yes. I, and eventually, it, and, and not only am I saying that like, I don't know about the should or the should not, I'm saying that eventually that will be the case. Right. It's like looking at like LeBron versus like Wade and Bosch. If you look at their price differences, it's, you know, it's like 20 X. It's, it's what you're talking about. Same with like Jordan versus Weber and Barkley and stuff. Like the differences in the value is so exponentially ridiculous that you're like, this is why I, I love that content around. I did this last, last year in football, which is like, if you're just going to buy these guys at these prices, just look at the guy that's the same player. From 20 years ago and look at their prices i could tell you what's going to happen to them you know like they're the next manning literally manning is cheaper than all these guys so like the next if he is the next manning he's still going to be cheaper yeah you said yeah. that football is actually like outselling basketball didn't you tell me that it like, is products? like yeah i'll give you an example like the uh this year's um football optic hobby box is about 500 bucks and this year's basketball optic hobby box is about 250. Do you think that's a rookie class thing, or do you think football cards are swinging the pendulum? Who, what rookie class? Brock Purdy and Kenny Pickett, oh. Sam Howell, and Desmond Ritter? <laughs> I mean, come on. So you're saying just this year's optic? No, I think it's other products too, although I can't tell you the numbers off the top of my head. But like, I, here's what I think, Josh. Here's what I think is happening. I yeah. think that um, domestically especially, we've – 
it's taken half a decade of people talking about it and thinking about it, but we finally reached the point where football's popularity in America and the fact that like a Thursday night football game gets more viewers than an NBA finals game, <laughs> that's finally starting to be reflected in the prices of new hobby products. Yeah, well, uh, these guys that are doing this flipping of all these quarterbacks right now are, I, I guarantee you, I fuck just, I'm calling my shot. That shit is, is going to get dumped and flooded the market. That young quarterback stuff is just going to absolutely get dumped, and you're going to start seeing all that money move to basketball in like the next month, guaranteed. For sure. No, that's a great point. And product also, value is going to, you're going to see this like, Basketball go back up and football go back down. Yeah, and I want to say this, too, about, like, the other players, about the Josh Allens and so on and so forth. These guys still are great players. Um, <clears throat> you know, but, it, but and I understand why people are gravitating to them because what if Josh Allen had the, his next five years or what Mahomes' previous five years were? You know, like, people are trying to – there's an excitement factor in, in picking a player who could have a great run. So, like, I get it. I get why people are excited about it. But I'm taking the historical view, and I'm looking at not what's the potential, but what is actually already played out, you know. But, yeah, to your yeah. point about, like, that, uh, that the QB prospecting game is just, like, reaching <laughs> levels unfathomable is, is right. Yeah. Dude, I, all the uh, – you had this take about – about gambling and I, I use the same take for fantasy football, which is like I get most of my knowledge around sports from fantasy football and gambling podcasts, not sports cards, because if I watch sports card content, I would think that Desmond Ritter is gonna be the next big thing. In fantasy football, he's not even brought up. It's not even a top, he's like the worst ranked fantasy football player. And nobody is fucking gambling or betting any money, real money on Desmond Ritter. It's like an absolute afterthought joke. But in the sports card hobby, it's like, oh my god, Desmond Ritter is like basically you know, the next Josh Allen or whatever. It's like, what? There's the, you know, there's no, like, logic behind a lot of it. That's such a painfully good point. Such a painfully good point that, like, our credibility as content creators is just, it's in, the just in the tank. If people actually look at what we think is good. It's awful. Yeah, it's really bad. I feel like an idiot where I'm like, I represent the space where Desmond Ritter – is not the 30th ranked quarterback and he's actually like the third, you know, it's just like, what is happening? I've did the fancy football <laughs> podcast today. They're talking about the value of B. John Robinson. And they're like, they're like, I just hope Desmond Ritter doesn't fuck it up for him. Like, and blow everything up where B. John Robinson's not valuable because they're always trailing because of Desmond Ritter. That's where it's at. It's the, it's like, the, this guy better not screw up this amazing talent. He's got around him offensively with Drake London and, John Robinson and Kyle Pitts and stuff. You know what I mean? For sure. <laughs> For sure, man. That's, uh, God, it's so painful. Last year was Trey Lance and Kellen Mond. Like, those guys are basically out of the league. <clears throat> yeah. Yep. I just, that, that's just sinking in right now. <laughs> but, but to bring it back to the baseball thing, you're saying that what we can learn from, from baseball is like eventually all the value kind of like eventually funnels to a few a fewer number of guys well that's what hauser 1921 collection said yeah and i don't i have to be completely frank here i don't know that much about baseball collecting so there's yeah. there's not like a ton for me to learn no there is a ton for me to learn i just don't know it that's what the point i'm trying to make is but if what hauser says is true which is that the cream rises to the top as time passes uh or to uh quote <laughs> From our chat, um, the man who made the the Perito Perito Perito. How do you say it? Can you just can you say it? Pronounce it for me. Pareto. It's not Pareto. Does not rhyme with burrito. It is Pareto. Why is the P always, always capitalized? Because it's uh, named for an uh, I believe an Italian economist named Pareto. Okay, so it's so it's a. Uh, it's like a okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So okay. All right. Uh, it's not a real word. It's a it's a pronoun. It's it's for an, it's named after something. Correct. Okay. Deep says you can say it either way. All right. Well, whenever I heard the name used in economics class, it was parade. Yo, you you heard you heard it in economics class. This is like I a did. legit like. 
<laughs> yes, yes. A little flex there. Flex on the hop. Look at you. You gonna <laughs> you gonna cite some like legal document or something like some stupid autobiography that none of us have heard of? Is that what you're gonna... <laughs> you better watch out. Yeah, I might. I better <laughs> you guys better be careful. All right. Uh let's go on here. <clears throat> Enjoy cards IG says what's the last surprise developments that your collection took and how did it get there yeah how how did you start collecting levy on bell jet cards how did that uh <laughs> how did well, we get right. here okay good you tell me my surprise turn and then i'll tell you yours oh Is that what you want my, you want me to reply to levy on bell like how that turn was made no 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 i like the way you said it. i no reply just well i guess you can but like you okay it's, it's hard for me to like say my own when i can i can third person yours yeah i mean it's, it's not so surprising to you you know like maybe I don't, I don't know i was prepared to talk about how i ended up collecting Jokic when like for a year on this show i said that he was boring to watch <laughs> <laughs> i was like that's a surprise but, but like okay i put the levy on bell one i like too um <clears throat> dude the levy on bell turn happened because there was was no one else I could afford uh, during that little during the yeah. little 2021 era. And I wanted yeah. to keep on having cards coming in, and now I'm I've committed to this PC, and I like it, and I'm just building it up. Yeah. Okay. Now, now mine for you is that you put some Penny Hardaway cards up for sale uh, over last week. All right, that's a surprise turn. So how how did that surprise come to be? Oh, so painful. It's fresh, man. It's like a fresh wound. It's like a, it's like one of those things where I'm like, am I making the right decision? I'm still not hundred percent sure. No, my initial thought was like, I said at the beginning of the show, I'm focused on getting rid of unnumbered cards. And I think, uh, there's a question coming up about like innovation. There's like some big topic on innovation. I'd like to get to that next, but like serial numbering is the biggest innovation that's happened to the hobby. And it's to me like the ultimate, innovation and i don't know that we need to improve on it because it's just like the ultimate control around supply you know like we can tell you exactly how many copies exist so having unnumbered cards cards numbered to 99 i'm less interested in that right now and a lot of the 90s stuff i feel like is kind of a little bit overhyped right now so that's my thought i don't know like i just was thinking like i'd rather have lebron's number to 10 yeah that makes a ton and i don't have infinite money Dude, I'm not a, I'm not a, you know, super rich tech, uh, you know, entrepreneur guy. Like I'm not super rich. I can only afford what I can afford. Fair enough. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, then let's go ahead and get to, there was two questions on the topic of innovation. I'll just read them both and then yeah. react. <clears throat> Ryan Bitter says, since their inception, cards have continued to evolve. My question is, what could we see in the future? Pre-80s were paper and mostly base. 90s saw chromium and shiny with inserts and parallels, and then the emergence of jersey patches. Have we reached the mountaintop, or will cards even be more different in the future? Do you wish it continues to evolve or just stay the same? And then the 615 collector says, it feels like the hobby could benefit from some product and or card design innovation. What would be your top ideas for innovative new card designs and or products? <laughs> Right off the bat, this is the Christina answer, which is like, you're not getting free, uh, you know, <laughs> entrepreneur ideas from us. Nice try. Right. No, thank you. Yep. Yep. Right. Uh, I think we're going the same way with this. We texted about it before the show started because we laughed about this topic. Um, I'm not, not sure how much more innovation you can have, you know, designing a, you know, a tiny, tiny piece of cardboard. It's like that word innovation to me is reserved more for like SpaceX and like, you know, we're trying to like put people on Mars and we're trying to like build AI and all this stuff. It just, it, I'm, it's just like the word innovation in cards seems a little silly to me. Um, and you know, the last few pieces of innovation we've had are like robot grading and vaults and fractionalization of cards. And I'm not sure any of those really stuck, you know? So if we're talking about fractionalization or sorry, we're talking about innovation of like, the designs itself, you know, new, new printing technologies or ways to like, you know, introduce new fancy ways to make them look better. I think we're running out of those. So 
I'm actually on the take of I'll steal your thunder. Maybe we should actually remove some of these goddamn innovations and just go backwards. Right. That is the zag that is brewing here after like a while, after like years and years of just sort of thinking about this and wondering how can we introduce competition to make cards better? How can we innovate? How can we take things to the next level? Then the Zoom is the, or I mean, I'm sorry, not the Zoom, the zag. The zag is let's go back. Let's take, instead of taking a step forward, let's take a step back and let's simplify. Let's unevolve, let's devolve a little bit. Let's, that's the zag that's brewing here is like, let's, let's not innovate. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's, <laughs> let's go back. Let's go back to the, the way 2012 Prism was made. Let's, let's go back. You ever get the feeling that like, we, you know, it's like, it's easier to make fun of the get off the lawn, like the older generation, but like, we're eventually going to be that. And like, maybe this is step one. Maybe it is. <laughs> maybe this is just like day one of us being like, I like the way it was in the old days. I don't like this new vaulting stuff. Wait, 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 wait. I'm sorry. What was that accent? That was like an old man back in mad day. <laughs> <laughs> Christina hasn't said a word this whole show, and here she comes. <laughs> what got her to speak up? She hasn't been feeling well tonight. She's got the chills, but she would speak up for this. I to call out your accent. I mean, come on. Call Josh, yes. you should, we should be encouraging him for trying out that. I mean, he didn't practice it. It was on the fly. I thought it was fun. <laughs> we need to, that's what we need to encourage in this hobby is trying things out. That's the innovation. More accents. <laughs> That's the innovation. But, you know, I don't want to make too much light of this topic because, like, dude, people get really excited about something new and fresh happening in cards. But, like, there's a there's a concern that just, like, innovation for innovation's sake yeah. probably isn't what we want. Right, let's and, like, the thing, that will, the thing that will fuel innovation is, like, if, like, people stop buying cards, then it's like, okay, what do we need to do to like reinvigorate this you know yeah that's when the last few like good innovations have come out right like the post junk wax era was like okay people have figured out like this isn't good and we got to figure something out let's serial number them you know it was like a forcing function of like we're fucked if we don't do something big and then it was like 2000 or post mj retirement pre lebron rookie class it was like the hobby was sort of dying down like what do we do well People seem to like this, like, jersey autograph. Let's do that. And that's sort of, like, boom, the next era, right? So that's a good point you call out, which is, like, we don't need to innovate until we're forced to. Right. It'll come out naturally. Yeah. Absolutely. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Iowa Dave said, says, Jordan didn't win a ring until year seven. Shaquille O'Neal won in year eight. And LeBron won in year nine. With Luca only entering his sixth season and being just 24 years old, and with four first team All NBAs already under his belt, why do you think the excitement around his cards has faded over the last year? What What do you think, Josh? Why What do you think is going on here? Why is it faded? Yeah, dude. If like MJ was a was in the same boat, the exact same thing would be happening to MJ. This happened to LeBron, especially. Like like those late Cavs years before I went to Miami, this was happening. It just is like this cycle of how it works, you know, until you actually win championships, like you kind of get this early excitement and then people sort of like forget about it over time and they move on to other rookies or whatever. This is this, it happens all the time. It's the same pattern every time. It's not surprising at all. Just people have just moved on to other players or whatever. And I, I've talked about this a bunch with Luca. It's like, dude, the guy literally can't do any better. They like absolutely maximized every single statistical individual thing he could possibly do, and his values are going down. So it's like uh, clearly, you know, I'm not sure what else he could do other than just like win a championship with that team. Yeah, I know exactly. And like there, it, with with each year that passes, you know, it's sort of like um, kind of like how people want to pick a quarterback that could be the breakout quarterback. Well, same thing in basketball. You know, as the years go by and new prospects get introduced, some people are going to be like, 
all right, I, Anthony Edwards is, is going to be my guy. Or Shea Gilders Alexander is going to be my guy. Or Wembenyama is going to be my guy. Or Chet Holmgren or Paolo Boncaro. You know, people are going to look and, like, as more prospects come in, the amount of money gets diffused across more people. But, like, to Deep Value's point as well, um, dude, his prices are already very high. On a card-for-card -card basis, they're more than Jokic. I know that uh, <laughs> acutely well. Um, so, like, to give an example, like, Jokic's color match rookie, Prism out of 199, PSA 10, go last sold for, like, eight grand. Um, Luca's color match, Blue Prism 199, PSA 10, which, like, the basically the same card for the same player, for a different player, but the same card. And Luca's population is twice as much. And his goes for, his last sold for 12.5K. So, like, the Luca's, like, like from the position of the Jokic, the Lucas is 50% higher. The Jokic would have to go up 50% more just to catch the Luka. So, like, I think if Luka wins an MVP and he wins a championship, I don't even think that, like, like moves his prices up, you know? I just – I think that stuff's already – there's there's already such a premium associated with collecting. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to, like, go into this topic without, like – criticizing the player who's already like done so much it's like oh this fucking guy hasn't won a championship yet what a loser it's like dude what what could he possibly do what there's only one champion each year like to your point it's like Jokic literally won the championship but he's still not more valuable so like it's a tough it's a tough thing it's just like only you know two or three guys it seems like really get that command that dollar yeah for sure <clears throat> good question that's it's, it's something that's, that's like, in the heart of the hobby is that cycle. It's like, and dude, this is going to happen with Wembenyama as well. It's going to happen, like, now. If you already – you posted a graph. I know. Tell, tell, say that one. Yeah, all right. So, <laughs> this is just so crazy. Has he even fucking played a game and he's already got a middle finger graph? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, all right. So, this is one of the few Wembenyama rookie cards on the market right now. It's the 2023 Slam Deck Collection, Equipes de France. And we track this. And we track this. And, like, here's the graph. <laughs> All right. Like, I'll change the scale from logarithmic to linear to just sort of make it even a little more pronounced. So, like, okay. Linear. Pareto, Pareto, linear, linear. <laughs> okay, I forgot. I, I fuck up the pronunciation. Okay. You just said it. You just like fucking rolled it off like it wasn't even matter. <laughs> All right. This was the value of this card on the first on the, his first summer league game. It was five hundred and fifty bucks. And this is the other important variable here. On that around that time, oh, the screen is so gigantic. Uh, the population was fifty eight. All right. So then he played, and it it peaked a little bit, you know, around the time of the second game, went up to eight fifty, and then in the intervening month, it's all the way down to two hundred and twenty eight dollars. So it's more than cut in half. And then if you look at the population, remember it was fifty eight. Now it's one hundred and fifty four. I forgot we have that feature. Yeah. No, that, that feature is so key when you're looking at stuff like this. That was really nice. Yeah. So, so a lot of that, like, you know, we make fun of it, but a lot of it's just, like, the fact that it's not a licensed NBA product. Mm -hmm. You know, NBA products are going to come out and just that stuff's going to keep them. Or think about the Zion Duke cards. Oh, God. <laughs> like, this, this just always happens. I get so angry about that topic the college contenders products that come out and like people are like yeah this is the th this is the one where like i know what happened last year but fucking this year is going to be the one no if prism's going to crush it it's going to go to the zero yep <clears throat> yep exactly okay all right uh lsu tiger collector 65 says uh what influencer cliche is the most overused and then in parentheses we have let's get it bro and the hobby is alive bill <laughs> is on the chat i need you to weigh in bill 
Let's let's do for the let's go for the chat for this one for some comedy. We'll just like start yeah. reading them off. From the chat. Let's get it is my top one where I'm just like, oh my god, please stop and saying Bill, that. Bill is a a kindred spirit of ours. I know Bill from uh, <laughs> Clubhouse, <laughs> and Bill and I used to fight off the NFT pumpers when they still would come around. He and I would fight them off, <laughs> and uh, we'll come into the card rooms and try to pry you away. Yeah, well they come. Man, like for like, there was a period of time where like, <laughs> there's a period of time like in 2021 when like you couldn't have a card room without somebody talking about how great Top Shot is, and then yeah. you know, and and now the, we haven't seen or heard from any of those people in years now. Uh, my <laughs> my favorite is the let's get it and they like hit the camera and they like cut to the next scene or whatever let's get it we boom we out here we out here okay so let me do let me get George. what you know i'm not going to name who says these so then we can give people the the anonymous confidence okay yeah. so the one guy says <laughs> one guy says what's the play <laughs> <laughs> what's the play what's the play Coke. Just like cooking in general, like, like let's cook, hobby positivity. Let's get it is, is the worst. Okay, grind. You got you to check, check this company, company out. Yeah. That's, that's like I've been in the hobby for five minutes, guys, and I've decided for for you guys, I've determined this is the best grading company, and I don't <laughs> even know this guy's name or I don't own a single card graded by this company, but I'm telling you right now. You're gonna to want to get in early and grade with this company. <laughs> okay, that's oh, buy the dip. Buy the dip. Buy the dip. I always um, thought that was a reference to the accessory to the Tostito. <laughs> I'm trying to think. I've been watching a lot of hobby content lately. For you. For me. Thank I'm you. doing the research, so you don't have to, and I send you the tip, the clips. My head hurts, so it's just really bad. It's painful. Well, dude, like, I, my hobby content consumption is ramped up from, like, zero to three in the, <laughs> in the off season. Um, On a scale of what to what? What is the scale? What is this three? The scale is, like, maybe, like, okay, let me be, let me be more precise. Let's right. say that there's 50, yeah. let's say, that, let me say there's 50 podcasts that I'm aware of. <laughs> um, like, I... I go from like normally listening to like two to three to maybe now I'm on like five. But but once the off season's over, I'll probably, I mean, Bill Simmons not putting out podcasts for weeks has created a massive void in the in the noise that I pollute the air around myself with. <laughs> Fancy football content is ramping up hard though, so that's what I've been filling my time with. Dude, Even, you told me to. I'm not like, Somehow I wasn't subscribed to the Ringer Fantasy Show, and then you told me, and I now I'm on it. I'm on it. It's good. I've listened to – I like Underdog Fantasy. They have good – I like those guys. They're good. Uh, ESPN, I'm, I don't know. I, since they lost Matthew Barry, I'm kind of over it. So. Fair. Uh, okay, we have a few more uh, influencer quotes here. I just made a massive play. <laughs> <laughs> With the massive and all quotes. eBay one of one. I mean, yeah, that's eBay one of one is tough. Uh, the term legit. <laughs> the term legit, yeah. Buy, seller. I like that. That's a good title, uh, Stiff. The air I pollute around myself with. <laughs> Did I, I say write that? that one, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Did you just chuckle at your own phrasing? I can't believe I said something that ridiculous. <laughs> okay. I did a thing. Yeah. Oh, okay. Like, we're going, like, a little bit beyond the – like, I don't know what the influencer ones are. But, like, if we're moving into some of the things that, uh, like, dealers say. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, available. Or, like, um, like – like dealers have come up with the most fancy, elegant sounding ways of saying this card is for sale. Like <laughs> contemplating making this available if the offer <laughs> reaches the correct status. You know, when 
he sent me this week. It was so funny for the guy. Was like, he was like, uh, it's I'm putting up for sale for eight grand unless someone wants to go higher. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm pretty sure we don't want to pay you more than the price. <laughs> I was like, eBay, best offer. Can I offer you more than your lowest, my friend? Is that, is that allowed? <laughs> eBay is like about to introduce a new feature that lets you offer over the bin price. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite one ever. It's just like, unless you fuckers want to start a bidding war on this shit, then I'll raise <laughs> them. <laughs> I'm just like, it's just like, like I know one thing about this hobby, and it's that every motherfucker will always pay less than whatever price you say. It's like you say that number, that's your absolute max. I'm never gonna give you more, no matter what the card is, unless you get. He pauses and he's like, unless you want to pay me more. more. <laughs> the other, my other favorite, just all time favorite, it's just gonna be like, you say like a a bunch of stuff about the card in a paragraph on Instagram and then you do the dot 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 vertically and then at the bottom it just says available. <laughs> or or the other new favorite is like I don't even have this card in hand yet, but it's available. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Available as soon as it's in hand. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? Like what you just bought this like five minutes ago. <laughs> The ultimate Party. flex in the hobby is if you can sell a card before you even get it and have the seller ship it to that guy. Dude, guys have been <laughs> doing this for years. Guys got like, dude, people will get like a picture of somebody's card that they're selling. And, they'll, and they, they like will be like, all right, hold on, I'm thinking about it. And then they'll come to me and try to sell it to me. And then if they can sell it to me, I'll pay them. Then they'll take my money and go pay less to the person who actually owns the card. I know that happened to you. I just like, I'm never going to stop laughing at that guy that was like, eight grand, unless you want to go higher. <laughs> like, dude, like what? <laughs> he, was so, he was so into it. He was just like, this card is so good that you guys are going to come over the top of my listing price. And it's going to be a mad, like, how, how, how does the logistic, but like, How's the logistics of that work? So like, let's say I say, all right, I'll pay eight grand for this card. And he's going to be like, hold, please. I'm waiting to see if there's any offers coming in over the list. <laughs> uh, Chewy in the chat did my other favorite one where they go, just pulled this card. It's my favorite card I've ever had. Definitely not for sale for now. <laughs> yeah, right, right. For now, not, not for sale yet. Yeah. It's code for I'm gonna grade it and send it to Golden. That's what that means. Right. <laughs> Stiff Arm Wax says I sold a card on eBay. As soon as it sold, they took my picture listings and put the card up for sale. <laughs> <laughs> Dude. Yeah. The other one, Lucky Show, where he says like I'll sell you at cost, or they say I can't. You know, I'm, I'm into it for this. I can't lose them. I can't lose on this. <laughs> Uh, a bit over asking on houses. Oh, so this is going to be like the all cash buyer coming in over ask. Is that, right. is that the new thing? That's what I thought about too. Like that is true that in housing, like you can have a price at list and then like you'll put, put in the offer in the real estate agent will be like, actually we have three offers over list. <laughs> and it's a private buyer, all cash baby <laughs> investor. And you're just like, I don't know what that means. Is that like some like oil tycoon guy? What the fuck? What are you talking about? Does he not even want this house? It's just going to be some guy that rents it out. Airbnb. Thanks. <laughs> That's like a flipper. An Airbnb or rental person is a flipper. <laughs> that was good. All right. That was. <clears throat> Thank you for that question, LSU Tiger Collector sixty five. Whew! It's the hardest I've laughed in a while. All right. Uh... Now the chat's just unloading on, on everything. The dentists will make the play. The Go ahead, guys. The other, the other bad one is like, this card's for sale. DM with interest. And then you DM them and they're like, taking offers. What the fuck? Is it for sale or not? Like, are you, what are you doing? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, that's brutal. <clears throat> that's just tough. Uh, <laughs> Serious buyers <I> only. <laughs> The arbitrage play, yeah. All right. Uh, 
Oh man, where do we go from here? Get this show. Okay. Six two six four. I don't know. Like I don't know if this question was a personal attack on you or me or Christina, or if it was just. I love personal attacks. Or if it was, uh, if, if it was the Queen's you, the you in general. <laughs> okay, it goes. It says this. Sixty six sports card says, "Should you take a hobby break?" This is, yeah. <laughs> Am I going too hard? Is this like, calm down, bro? Like maybe maybe stop spending money. <laughs> I don't know what this. It was too. Is it is it a question of like, should anybody just take a break from time to time, or is this like you guys need to take a break from the hobby? The crossover is like so bad. Well, I have to call out this one in the chat. I got an offer on eBay if you can match it. That was my other. I sent you that one where it was like I was offered fourteen hundred on eBay. Does anyone want to give me fifteen hundred before? It's like, isn't the point that you would take the same amount with no fees? You actually went over the price. Look at you. Um, we were on a break. Is this like a friends thing? We were on a break. I'm on a. I need a break. <clears throat> but here's the thing, all right. Here's what I think about when, like, I think about somebody taking a break from the hobby. How do you take a break from something that you do only because you like it in your <laughs> recreational time? This is the break. This is the break. <laughs> or it's like, what? Like, are 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 there people out there just like, like, ah, oh, God, I gotta look at my cards again today. I gotta pull up eBay and just look at those same searches, even if it kills me. It's like, it, I, it's it's the like, dude. If I felt the need to take a break from the hobby as a collector, I just would do it. Like, I I don't know. I just wouldn't spend my spare time, my precious spare time, doing something I don't like to do. You know. So like the concept of taking a break from the hobby, like it's like if you're doing the hobby and you're not enjoying it. Then yeah, you should take a break. But I don't even know why you're why are you doing it if you're not enjoying it. Yeah, maybe I just take it as like take a break from spending money. Like maybe like start focusing on creating content around showcasing your cards instead of buying more and okay. spending money. Yeah, I mean that's <laughs> that's different. But and I and I agree. I get, <laughs> See what is like. I get that. <laughs> Look at poopy. This is yeah. eating a pizza while placing bids can be pretty exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> this is the part of the show where like the giggling is starting to hit a peak and it's like here come the office quotes and the pizza references pretty you know it's like we're, we're divulging into that. <laughs> yes. Okay. That's good though. I always so want to be careful. Here. Question about office quotes. Yeah, yeah. All right. We do have some questions about but office I mean, quotes. Like, but I understand if like People are seeing content that is just influencers, and they're like, I'm sick of this. Yeah. These people don't even collect. I need to take a break. Like, no, you just need to mute those motherfuckers, like, or block them. Like, go look some collectors up and follow their pages and find the joy again. That's great advice. <clears throat> I'm going to give you a little hack, or I don't know if this is a hack, or this is me being. Idiotic. Oh, is this like a TikTok thing coming up, bro? Yeah, Kyle, turn the TikTok camera on. <laughs> that was good. That was uh, good. Uh, all right. So, what do you do when you have somebody who's like, you know, they're like verging into that influencer category of content, but like you still want to see some of it? Or like you really like you don't want to offend them by like unfollowing and stuff, you know. Like, well, I mean, you don't deal with you don't have this problem. Maybe I you don't, problem. but I do. <laughs> okay, well, I'm like, so what do I? So like, what I've done, or like, just to get stuff out of my algorithm, because like, especially like during, during the national, there's some accounts that are just sharing stuff that I just like. I do not want to see this, but like, not during non-national time, this account's fine. So I report their content. <laughs> this is good. And that, this is good. that takes it out of my algorithm for like a short period of time. And then, you know, it comes back. What do you, okay, so what do you report them for? I think there's an option that just says like, I just don't like this. Like, oh, I, I, do, I do the scam one. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, this is inappropriate for children. I go straight for the heart. I go for like, this is like, appropriate nudity or something 
Never mind. <laughs> yeah, you never mind. Christine, <laughs> Christine's about to one-up this in a way that we don't need it to be one-upped. I've definitely done this before, especially if it's one of those, like, sponsored ad ones where it's like, I don't even follow this person, and I keep getting their sponsored ads because it's card-related, and Instagram doesn't know the difference between, like, collecting and investing, so they just fucking shove all the investing ones at me. I go, oh, guess what, Instagram? Let me help you out here. I'm going to report this gentleman for inappropriate behavior towards, you know, underage people. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, like Instagram, like, I don't think they review any of these reports and like, they never, no action ever. I, maybe I'm deluding myself into thinking it pushes it out of my algorithm and it doesn't even do that. Yeah. Well, I'm, waiting for like someone to get arrested for like you know my rep i'm reporting to like this things that like you should be arrested for this and they're not getting arrested so you're right it's not working <laughs> it's, not, it's not working all right uh mahoney cards said can we get back to the office references <laughs> can we get back to those yeah why did we ever try. get to them in the first place how did that come to be? How did, how did like hour two and three come to be dominated by the office? Because, because I like to talk about me and I really know that show well and you know, it's my show. Fair. You are the master of that show. I think we were all the watching it. We were. At the time. But was it just coincidence? We oh yeah, you guys were watching it. Well, we you guys were watching it. We started watching it because of the crossover. That's why. We wanted to, I wanted to understand the references. Yeah. And then I ended up it's just that I've, I've seen it so many times. I've seen it like six or seven times all the way through. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. But just like what was – it was something about also like the absurdity of what was going on in the hobby at that time. Yeah. That just like nudged our show into wasn't there, mania. Wasn't there also like an episode where you guys tried to like name – people were in the hobby. Yeah, that I think we did that like eight times. Uh, okay. It yes. was a recurring thing. We had a period of time where we were going three hours deep just because we're maniacs and we don't do that anymore because we've tried to like tighten it up with content. But it was like we literally got through all the questions and it's like, well, how was your guys' office episode you watched last night? <laughs> what did you guys have for for dinner <clears throat> all right well the people are clamoring for some, like this this show is like a throwback like we've got we've got multiple questions of people just like sports cards suck as investments and we've got the people wanting the office content back in their lives does any of this correlate with the market yes totally man yes it does it has to be yeah. i think so too like when we're flying high you know, everyone's excited, the hobby's bumping, you know, market's going up. We just start letting it fly with all the jokes and making fun of people, trying to balance it out, bringing the office quotes. When it's down, it's like, we got to basically, like, land this fucking plane for everybody. Well, so that, yes, we, <laughs> that's so true. All right, so Card Shop Dad asks, what inning are the office references in? What inning? <laughs> yeah, we got two questions about the office? Two, two questions about the office. I wanted to say a joke. Okay. Is she ranting or can I do my joke? Go ahead, go ahead. All right. I've been in some lives recently where people have more followers than I do. Way more. And there's like seven people in the live. <laughs> and there's like four, four people doing it. It's where like you add up those four people's followers and like their Venn diagram of who's following both and stuff is like, how do you guys have seven? We've got 70 people, 60 people, and we're not even talking about sports cards anymore. What's going on? So is it that that, that content is like, pay, you know, like fake followers? What's going on there? I don't know. It makes you think. It does make you think. <clears throat> that that's I think about that a lot. Christina's joke that she got in that she repeated to the chat was that uh, her question is, are office references in the seventh inning stretch? She called it a stretch, and then, and then she fixed it and said stretch. So is that like a, a stretch? What is that? Is that like a... It was a <laughs> fucking stutter like, while I was trying to get it out while you were talking over. Thank you. Is this one of the side 
side effects of being sick, you can't even type. Yep. <clears throat> yep, the seventh inning stretch. I think that could be a, a show title, actually. She tried to make fun of my accent earlier, and that was a mistake, because now I'm going to be off into, like, a talk. Every mistake she fucking makes, every, like, slip up, we're going to be just on it. Fair. I welcome it. All right. Uh, let's see if I can get to one or two or three more questions here. Um, Mike okay. Pinkerton 50. All right, Mike Pinkerton. Mike Pinkerton 50 says, <clears throat> I feel like this is the best time to collect and invest in cards. What do you guys think? Hmm. Because, are we implying that this is like the bottom? Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know if that's where that was going. Or, or is this question going in the direction of like, this is, you know, in the same tone as like observations, like this is the best time to be alive. Because mm. like, yeah, even though the economy might be down a little bit relative to two years ago, or things might be shitty in different aspects of different people's lives, which it is. But like, at least we're not shitting at outhouses. <laughs> we're shitting like pipe delivery systems. Um <laughs> Uh, I took this as like I'll 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 take this as, as there's a, an inflection point that's happening right now, and we've we've been joking about it that the questions we're getting are are sort of like alluding to it as well, where the tone is shifting from, uh, you know, making fun of auctions happening to like uh, positive, you know, moving into like a more positive state of the market moving up. So it it does kind of feel like that. <clears throat> yes, it does. All right. Uh, You've got to come up with something. I'm telling you, man. You can. You have to come up with a term. I know. I know. I know. I don't know what it is, though. I know. We'll we'll noodle on it. As you're like, uh, I'm your I'm your agent on this. We got to figure something out. <laughs> okay. Um. <clears throat> all right. Uh. Oh. All right. Look. Turn your brain. Ooh. <laughs> Remember that? I do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, hold on. Turn turn your brain on for a minute for two questions. All right. I really wanted to get to these questions. Right. It's unfortunate that they're buried <laughs> after jokes about outhouses. <laughs> but here we go. Wait, now you make make noises and I can't even help myself. <laughs> <laughs> well nothing could really match that like as soon as I made that noise at the mint. You and Stiff just both just looked at each other and just started laughing. It was like 20 minutes straight of us just being like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let me. <clears throat> Let's go. Drake's PC. <laughs> oh, Drake. I apologize for the noises that are coming into your <laughs> All right. Drake's PC. <laughs> it says, many people are set collectors of base sets, insert sets, and parallel sets. If you were going to collect one set each from football and basketball, what would they be and why? So football and basketball, a base set, an insert set, and a parallel set. So this is like a big question to be put on the spot with, right? But like, let's just start. Let's just work. Let's just work through it and see where we get. So like, all right, base set, base set. I'm going because I've been thinking about this set this week, 1948 Bowman basketball. The first basketball set ever made. I like that. I'm going, that's my base set for basketball. Are we going to yeah. go back and forth? Yeah. I'll do a base. Uh, 2003 Exquisite, because the RPAs are in the base. Nice, nice. Yeah, that's a good one. Loophole. Loophole. Okay. Um, insert set for basketball. Uh, rubies. No, I'm just joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. That's a parallel. Uh, an in insert set for basketball. <laughs> Do you know that? Or did I just, like, make you aware of it? <laughs> I'm going to have to go PMGs. No, uh, all right. <clears throat> An insert set would be. <laughs> I don't know, man. This is uh, 
There's a lot of great ones. There's a lot of, here's the thing with inserts. There's a lot of good ones, but maybe no great ones. Yeah, I'm not, a, we're not big insert guys. No. We're just no, not. No. So I guess, um, there's just so, I mean, you can just take your pick, you know, I just take your pick at, uh, not like thrill seekers, either one of the two years from 90s there you go. or golden touch or so. I mean, there's just so many. I don't feel like doing this for basketball and football, so I'm going to say cut above for both. Boom. Nice, nice. I'm Okay, well, like, I, cut above for football is, is a better insert than it is for basketball. That's why it's a, a good answer, because I don't have to do it. I like Again. it. Again. Okay, and then, we, and then best for last, what we like the most, parallel sets. Parallel sets. Okay. So, uh, a single one? I, well, I'm going to show some love. So I'm going to do football first. And I'm going <laughs> to... You fucker, don't take my answer for football. You're going to do it. Dude, no. I, you can go first. I guarantee I don't have your answer. Okay, good. Cracked ice. Yeah, you, you love cracked ice. That's... Right, I have a uh, title here. We're not big insert guys. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. <clears throat> Here's my answer. For football, 20... Oh, fat snacks, you got me. 2017... Prism black, black finite one of one set. It, a parallel. Have we ever? Have we seen the Mahomes publicly? <laughs> I don't know if it's ever been pulled. I don't know. Maybe we've got to put a bounty out on that. Um. Uh, that's your favorite football. You didn't do basketball yet. And then basketball. Uh. Gem Masters ninety eight ninety nine. No, it's good. Yep. You didn't say green PMG. Uh, green PMG is just such a boring answer. It's it's not that yeah, it's a boring. It's an amazing set, but it's just it's just so obvious. That's what makes. Me yeah, so like I'll just say it, but it's not my answer. Yeah. Because you have to just like. That. I just wanted to. I I was gonna like just say gold refractors in general and gold prism. Like I just didn't want to pick a year. I just like the. I just think that that's just my thing. I just like them all. Yeah, fair enough. And, and for football, crack guys. Yep, and we didn't give an answer for base set football. football. Uh, I don't know. I need to research the history of football more. Uh, maybe I would like the first ever major release base set of football just to go with the basketball. Yeah, like the Bronco Nagurski. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if he's in the first ever set or not. I need to look in. I need to research that. The Newt Rockney. Uh, okay. 96 credentials is one of the answers that comes in. All right. Okay. All right. And then another question similar from Cardiac Kemba PC. What five key cards of a 90s player, a 2000s player, and a Panini era player would create a top PC? And can we agree that less is more? Okay. So five cards from the 90s five cards of a 90s player to make a top pc let's do it together yeah. let's try to figure this out let's try to figure it out let's try and like what limits should we put on this because like well, let's just say no one of ones we should probably well i was gonna i was thinking like you should have a, you should have one one of one just pick one okay. that's what i was gonna say like you got to find a way to get one of them i like that um, I don't say I'm not saying we don't have to pick it. I'm just saying like if you can somehow get one and then you get the other four, you've got a top five PC. Fair. All right. Or, well, all right. So you get one one of ones. Like a basketball, like you're you have slim pickings. You've got two platinum medallions, right. one of ones, and like gem masters and flare showcase masterpieces. <clears throat> all right. So one one of one of one of those. Get like a row two, you know, one of the easier ones relative to those other guys. Okay. And then what are the other four? Are you just saying it can be anything? No, now now we gotta get specific. Green PMG, right? Yep. Yep. You do, keep going. What else? Uh, <clears throat> if your player has a low numbered credentials. Ooh, like the yeah. now. Because not everybody has a low numbered one. Those are definitely the top three. 
Yeah. Yeah. In my, in, I think you're right. Especially, you know, we're thinking like MJ and Kobe and stuff. Those guys both have low numbered credentials for sure. Yeah, because there's some players who have like 33 and yeah, uh, 48 or whatever. Yeah, it's 81 is the total. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Agreed. Uh, does that so? So, and then what about the other two? Maybe throw like, two more. Is a, yeah. I think you need a ruby in there. Rubies. Absolutely. Let's yeah. say 98. Yeah, let's throw the 98 rubies in there. And then can we give one slot to an insert? Like a PSA 10 low pop insert? Nah. This is like, this is a ranking for to be in the top yeah. five. You got. Yeah. No, you're right. you, you, you need you need to fill out the five. Yeah. So then, what's number five? <clears throat> I mean, I would go with the PMG Championship. I know you're not as big on it. Sure. Yeah. Okay. You go with the gold. Maybe, maybe like I'll go with the red. Okay, the red. Yeah. Sure. Okay. All right. And then two a two thousands player. Man, I, I just I can't help but think like we just did MJ. Now we got to do LeBron, right. and then the next we're gonna do you know that's just how I think about it. So it's like uh, you need the RPA. You need the lowest numbered RPA. You need the lowest numbered RPA. Yep. You need that. You, you need, need. What about like uh, what about like that credentials one of one LeBron that Nick Uliano put a oh. tiny bounty <laughs> on. Yeah, that would be nice. That would get you there. That will help you get there. What about just like a – I mean, if we're going to, like, do this, you want to be top five and you don't want to solidify yourself, you need kind of like that logo man yeah. auto RPA. Yes, you need – and I'm not, I'm, not, I'm going to say you don't even need a rookie year one, but you need a, a, within the first five playing years, logo man, RPA, LeBron, one of them. Because there can't be that many. How many could there be in his first five years? Not many. Not many. There is. There's one at auction right now. I know, I know. There, but that, but that one sold like within the recent, and yeah. it's got the nine autograph, and it's like a, the auto really sucks. Yeah. Yep. All right. <laughs> Keep going. Um, you need like the gold refractor rookie. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm yep. Yep. But do you need the finest out of twenty-five or the tops of chrome? You just asking me to list like the top five LeBron cards. Yeah, I guess that's where this is going. Or like you know, if we're, there there are uh, we, we haven't even met, we haven't even said the word super fractor yet. Yeah, mm. you need, you, there needs to be a super fractor in this as well. We got the logo man autograph. We need a super fractor. Hold on while I go kill myself because I don't have any of these cards. <laughs> But this isn't LeBron specific. Like there weren't what super fractors were there in all three? There was none. Yeah. So like this isn't LeBron specific. I'm just talking like Yeah, Curry's got one. I mean it's like you could do it for Curry in the two thousand, two thousand nine. He's got the super fractor, the logo man RPA auto. Um then I feel like it is like the low number at RPA, like that, you know, like that of five or 25 or something for Curry or the 23 for LeBron, and then like the gold refractor for Curry, the chrome one. And let's do like one more. Let me think. <laughs> yeah, I do like the like. Off year super fractor too. Yep. So what? Uh, like you need like a third year super fractor of the of the player. Yep. All right. All right. Take us home for modern. <clears throat> modern is so easy because I think about this all the damn time. So here would be my answer for football. NT platinum shield RPA one of one. Prism Black Finite, one of one. Optic Gold Vinyl, one of one. Contenders Championship or Super Bowl Ticket, one of one. And for number five, look, maybe, you know, if the player has 
a nice flawless shield one of one. That's an obvious choice. Uh, I'm five one of one. I, I'm more lean towards like field level black one of one or select XRC black one of one if your player had that redemption. But there, I gave, I just gave six for football. And then so it says to get it says to be have a top five PC. You just named like the ultimate impossible task yes. of being the number one undisputed champ. I gave you the top five cards. Oh. <laughs> I gave you the top five cards. And then for basketball, it's the National Treasures Logo Man Autograph RPA one of one. It's the Flawless Logo Man Autograph RPA one of one. The Immaculate Logo Man Autograph RPA one of one. You need all three. And then the Prism Black. And then for the fifth, Optical Nebula. What about Nebula? Hmm? What about Nebula? Nebula. Nebula is a consider a definite a definite consideration as well. Man, you just built the like. Does anyone actually have all five of those for any player? Dude, for Christian McCaffrey, I basically do. You don't have the shield. Correct. Oh, correct. Yes. I don't have the shield. That's the one that I need. And the owner of the shield, I message him every like six months or so. Or he messages <laughs> me. And like he made the shield available to me recently. And I offered a huge amount. And he said no. So I pumped the brakes. I said, like, I'm not going to go crazy here. And then he has been selling some of his smaller McCaffreys, he's been sending them to eBay. And I've been seeing them come up. All the, all the McCaffrey chat, we've been, like, watching this guy sell some of his smaller cards. And so we're all, like, praying that, like, that shield is going to be the last one to come to auction, like, right before the season starts or something. So, all three of you? <laughs> yeah, well, everybody's watching because they just want – they're not going to bid. They just want to see how big of a fool I'll make of myself. <laughs> They're gonna bid you up to raise the value of their own collections. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, so like, I, there is hope. Like, it's not like this card is just like in the void. I know where it is, and I'm just, I'm just send that thing to auction. Dude. So rank, rank, rank these three cards for me as a noob modern. Uh, Prism Black, Nebula, and Optic Gold Vinyl. For me personally. Oh no no no! Not for you. For the like, what what do you think would be the most common if you took a survey of every person in the hobby? What's the result? Well, that's all right. I'll do two different things. I'll say what I think the market would dictate, and then I'll say what I think the survey would say. I think the market would go Prism Black, Prism Nebula, Optical Vinyl, but I think the survey would go Prism Black, Optical Vinyl, Prism Nebula. Interesting. That's what you do too, right? That's your personal. Yeah, my personal is I have optical vinyl above Nebula. Because I didn't know this about Nebula, where it only comes from choice. So it is kind of a – that makes it a little bit, you know, less desirable, right? I guess. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. It, but if it does, the thing that compensates for it is that it looks amazing. Right. Yeah. Right. looks really – it's a great but it's not like the true one of one it is not and it doesn't have like the prism black one of one goes back to 2013 mm. and the nebula goes back to 2018 so some like powerpoint bro made the nebula what's that some like powerpoint guy made the nebula he's like we need another one <laughs> yeah i guess so but what, what's cool about it is that uh prism choice is an asia exclusive so, mm. like, it was the Prism 1 of 1 designated for the Asian market. I see. Well, really? Fast break and choice switch off. Which one goes to the Asian market? Oh, okay. Well, 2018 went to the Asian market. Yes. And the irony of that was an American breaker, Layton, pulled the Luca W. <laughs> so, he got his hands on the, the Asian product somehow, but... All right. So you basically are like really strong in your belief that the one-on-ones will define this era. 
I am. I am. Yep. Yep. I feel strongly about that. And uh, the thing that lets me know that, that one of ones in this era are not what one of ones in the 90s are. Right. <clears throat> like, here, think about this. Last year's select football, one product had more one of ones in it than every playing year's Michael Jordan major release had of one of ones combined. <laughs> Yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot. Yeah, select with all the one of ones is just brutal. <laughs> just so many. <laughs> so it's like the specific one of ones. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Exactly right. Because LeBron doesn't. He has the credentials one of one, but that's by that's kind of by chance because it's like the credentials where he's the only one that has a one of one. So it's not like a, uh, you know, it's not like a defined one of one where every player has it and this is like the, the chase for that rookie. He just happens to be the one guy. Damn, that's crazy. Like how Grant Hill is the one of one. Yeah. Yeah. And like it's it's, it's not by chance because, you know, obviously like he was the top prospect, so they're like, let's make him the one of one. It'll be awesome. But but I but I see what you're saying. It's it's not like it, it's a one of one parallel. Yeah. That it's not. You know, no. Yeah. <clears throat> that's pretty cool. So so my, I was saying that because like his rookie cards are not defined by one of ones. He has one of one rookies, you know. He he's got like the the triple logo man, uh, or the dual logo mans with MJ, Kobe, like the separate the two separate cards. He's got that one. He's got the ultimate collection logo man RPA, which is a horizontal card. He doesn't have the, you know, exquisite uh, logo man RPA to himself. So he doesn't have that. He doesn't have like a super fractor chrome. He doesn't have a super fractor out of finest. He does have a actually has a finest like die cut X fractor one of one. Okay. So that there's another one of one that Bob has. Bob Mtrek has that one. So there's a few for sure one of ones, but it's not as like defined as it is today, where it has like this consistent lineage. Yeah. <clears throat> well. That sucks, but it's also, you know, <laughs> I think about 90s, but, you know, there's never the right balance, you know, like the Panini era has too many one of ones, 2000s and the 90s didn't have enough. There you go. What are you going to do? All right, all right, let's name this episode. All right, let's hear them. Uh, uh, here we go. Christina, are you paying attention? Yeah. Uh, first up, we have the squeak of excitement. <laughs> That's your boat. You haven't even heard the rest. With like a mouse emoji? With a mouse emoji? All right. Uh, <clears throat> shit tube delivery system? Nope. Nope. It's, it's not, not ready. ready. It's not, I'm crossing that out. Keep it short if you can. <laughs> and then, and then it, it, it decidedly was not short. Uh, he hasn't played a game and already has a middle finger graph. <laughs> Good. <laughs> that's that fucking is, that's fine. Uh, accessory to the Tostito? <laughs> I don't know what that means. Um, <clears throat> The air I pollute around myself with? That doesn't even make sense. I know. Uh, seventh inning stretch. At least we're not shitting in outhouses. <laughs> and we're not, final one, we're not big insert guys. Uh, how did we not get a title out of the whole, uh, uh, like 8K offer me more shenanigans? Oh man, that's a great question. Can we, uh, like, on the fly, like, make a title out of that? It was too good. It was, it was too good. Uh, I don't know. I, I struggle with this. I'm not because it's kind of, 
it's making fun of the upcoming shit we're gonna have to deal with if the market comes back where we're gonna start dealing with uh that type of stuff i know i just i didn't write anything down right, and I don't know, right. nothing i'd probably go with the squeak one but because nothing else really jumps out at me with the mouse emoji christina mouse emoji yeah, another Tyler contender was the Queen's U. That was good. I I had that written down. I skipped. Incoming it. and available. Incoming and available. Yeah. Yeah. See, yeah, I think we should, I think we should try to like force a title into that whole topic because we just had so much good content from it. Yeah. Okay. Incoming and available is good. Picked up my grill for sale. <laughs> you gotta do a. Uh, can you do incoming dot 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 and available? Yes, I certainly can. That'd be mine. I like that one, Christina. I like that too. Are you okay with that? Let's go. Incoming dot 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 and available. All right. <clears throat> Thanks for all the great questions, guys. Sorry that I didn't get to about 30 of them. 30? <laughs> See you guys next week. <laughs> A lot has changed since Card Ladder began. We started with 500 cards in our database, and now we have over 3 million cards and over 30 million sales. For anyone asking who is the best, we put in our hands up. With Card Ladder's sales history feature, we have virtually every card in our system. If the card you are looking for ever sold on one of these platforms, you can find it using Card Ladder's sales history. And you can add a card to your collection with just one click. My time, my time. None of you people can tell me to stop. Plus, every card, no matter the last time it sold, has an estimated value that we calculated using our state-of-the-art player indexes. Unlike other apps, when you see Card Ladder's verified check mark, that means a researcher personally vetted each and every sale. We know what it takes to be reaching the top. We know what you want because Card Ladder was created by collectors for collectors. We know what it takes to be reaching the top. Join the innovators, not the imitators. Card Ladder 2.0, constantly innovating. Try it for free. See why Card Ladder is the industry leader in sports card data. We know what it takes to be reaching the top. Card Ladder 2.0.